Hello, everybody. Welcome. So we have um, 200 and some odd people that replied that they will be attending, but most of them are going to be attending online. So thank you for the people who are here for coming out. And uh, I want to thank everyone for all the hard work they've done in the past really two years with our pandemic situation. The huge amount of work that it has taken everyone in every position in the college. I can't thank you enough for making it run as smoothly as it has. So um, I'd like to just um, spend a little bit of time on a very short presentation without slides and um, discuss um, what's going on and what are the topics of the day that you would be, might be interested in, hopefully will be interested in, and, um, and then follow that by so a Q&A. So there is a spot on, on, online that where you can go um, to uh, click on questions and you can put your questions in there. Now, for those who don't have laptops, Nate, what would should we do, be doing? In the chat, but there are people here with, that are not looking at, yeah. don't have what? Oh, it's in there. Okay. 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 So, um, and we'll take as many as we can, but I, we do have three uh, distinguished scientists that will be speaking today, and I want to make sure that they have time uh, to do that. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about the budget. I know that's always like something that's top on people's lists. It's been top on mine since I started here as dean because the budget has not changed since I became dean. And uh, you know about our unique situation in the state, and we didn't have um, a new budget signed by the governor, so we didn't get a new budget. So I basically, you know, we are uh, set with the money that we've had since 2000, probably 16. And so this year, I'm hoping that things change because our budget actually looks pretty good. If the budget is signed as it is going to the governor, looks like there'll be some raises. It looks like there'll be um, really decent money for the university because there is a significant enrollment increase. And I, I know I've been coming to the departments to talk. I still have two more departments to do, so some of this will be repetitious for you. But it's good news, so repetition is probably OK. Um, so because we're such a big part of teaching the engineering students, and this enrollment increase is for engineering, which amounts to um, two or I'd say 3,000 students over a four to five year period, this is a significant um, role that we play in it. And so we're working with the provost and chancellor's office to get a piece of that budget increase so we can hire faculty um, to cover that teaching and also staff, because we are hugely understaffed, as you know. So I'm hoping that this enrollment increase gives us a, a push ahead and that we can do some significant hiring of some top-notch faculty, top-notch in teaching and research. So, the next thing is renovation. There is a lot of money in this budget for renovation if it passes. So everything I'm saying is it's gotta be signed or we don't get it, but um, it is $150 million. So renovation budgets, we usually get, I don't know, three to five million, but our needs on campus tally $500 million. So $150 million is gonna go a long way. And it's really great for us because science is going to probably benefit the most from the renovation money. The renovations are going to be um, on North Campus where our science buildings mainly are. And, um, and we will be, they will be addressing Dabney issues. So um, we'll see how things flow from there, but I think that's a significant amount of money and 
to address significant problems. So I'm pretty happy about uh, that um, because it's going to benefit us. So we have two major benefits from this current budget. And I'm hoping that it gets signed and I find out how much money we get so we can start spending it. Um, the next thing is I just wanted to make a couple comments about the strategic plan. Um, we have finalized the culture charter and the strategic plan is in final stages of, of production. The next part is like really the important part. And that is we need to put together a plan for operationalizing the strategic plan. For implementation, we will need a schedule for the rollout of the plan over time. So it doesn't sit on a shelf, but we have an active group of people making sure things are being pushed forward. So um, we're hoping to be done with this by the end of the semester, and we'll be working on it hard in the next month. So um, that is it for the strategic plan, and I'd like to address the mysterious academies that I'm sure people are wondering about. And um, right now, um, these were in the strategic plan for interdisciplinary programs. The structures um, you know, are now being formed because we have gotten the first director of data sciences, Rachel Levy, who's in, who is actually a faculty member in our college in the mathematics department. And so um, the plan is that all colleges will be represented in each of the academies. So um, the next academy that has now been formed, and it's formally formed, and that is we had a, a genetics and genomics initiative, which I'm sure you all remember coming out um, when I first became dean the first year. And that has gone so incredibly well that they've decided to make that an academy and blending in with it a lot of other already functioning programs. Uh, for, this is really a Koss and Cal's initiative working together. And Fred Gould in entomology is the director of the academy, but he was also the person that pushed this forward. And he has an amazing you know, class act um, group that are working with him, executive uh, council. So, um, so we are involved very strongly in the first two academies. Future academies include, um, are not formed yet and not decided on, but I hear rumors about ecology, coastal resilience, and other things. But we'll see, because I know people are putting uh, proposals together to be presented to the provost. So um, I think I'll take questions now. And then after that, um, I'd like um, Josh Pierce to come up and talk about our new integrated sciences building and where we are in that process. So um, yeah, 10 minutes. OK, um, so questions. And anybody at home can click into their computers, and we'll get the questions here. I wasn't that clear. Yes, yeah, Scott. Okay, good. Anything coming up in the online? Okay, well, I guess when there's good news, people don't have a lot of questions. And um, so um, I'm going to ask Josh to come up. And I don't think I need to stay here, you know, with you. Okay, maybe I should stay here. No, I can answer the questions from over there. Oh, and I didn't do, I didn't do the right job. It's like thanking uh, Nate and Christy for putting all of this together and Jamie for getting us organized as always. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Thanks, I'm just going to get my heart.
Adim again for starting us off. And uh, I think this was the welcome slide to the meeting. Um, and so that's uh, uh, there. And so I want to talk for three to five minutes about two things. Um, one of them is a chemistry of life program, which I'll note is not an academy. Um, I'm not sure what that means, but uh, ask me in a few years and maybe I'll know. Um, but uh, it's a, a really exciting uh, program that's really tasked with sort of interfacing the molecular focused science with life focused sciences across NC State. And maybe not all 10 colleges, but certainly um, four colleges are heavily involved in, in this program. Um, we're really focusing on both teaching, training, and research, and really trying to develop programs that enable us to do that and make it a unique program, not just here at NC State, but also in, in the UNC system. And so the Chemistry of Life uh, program currently involves over 40 faculty um, from four colleges. Um, it's led by sciences and is part of a broader comparative medicine institute, which I co-direct and serves to really facilitate the function of the, the effort across campus. Um, we have new courses. Um, we have new tr uh, training programs. Um, we have an NIH-funded T32 grant and a Beckman, Sciences, uh, a Beckman uh, Scholars grant uh, for undergraduate students, and both of these were secured in our first year, which has been super exciting and, and really great to attract um, top talent to NC State. And so this program is growing. Um, it's uh, our cohort of NIH T32 students come from five different graduate programs from four different colleges, just to reflect the interdisciplinary nature of the program. And there's lots of information about the program on the website, and happy to talk with you all more about this um, in the future. Um, it's the reason that I'm leading off with the program is it really sets the stage for thinking about what the vision of the new integrative sciences building may be. And if you don't know, um, there's going to be a new building where Harrelson Hall was. Um, and that's on the Brickyard. You can see the, the general location for that building here. Um, there was a lot of sites on main campus considered for this building, but this was the um, winner for a lot of different reasons, which I could go into at great length, but you probably don't want me to. Um, it's just the obvious site for this sort of hallmark science-focused building on campus. And so there's not a final design for this building yet. What I'm about to show you is just a mock-up of the general idea of what this might look like. And so this is the, the gist of the building. It'll likely be five stories. It'll likely have two stories of teaching and three stories of research, teaching on the bottom and research on the top. To be quite frank, it's going to be just gorgeous and, and uh, you know, a, a real uh, highlight on main campus. It's meant to be sort of that architectural gem on main campus that um, the Hunt Library and other buildings have really been on, on Centennial campus. And, uh, uh, you know, I think we have the budget and the people on board to really be able to do this. And so what is this building going to be and what is it going to sort of stand for? Um, well, the, you know, we don't have to read all of this, but really it's meant to be an interdisciplinary sciences building that really highlights um, chemistry, biochemistry, biology, and biotechnology. And so, you know, a chemistry, life science, biochemistry um, building is what we're looking at here. It's going to be a huge benefit to the College of Sciences, and, and many faculty and students are going to find themselves located in this building. There's going to be a lot of efforts to have science on display in this building, um, really engage the public, particularly in the, the ground floor um, where there will be flow through from the brickyard into the other buildings on campus, which as Dean McCann mentioned, as part of this vision, hopefully will also receive some substantial uh, renovations and upgrades to really make a science corridor that's uh, really attractive and, and uh, appropriate, I think, for much of the exciting stuff we're doing here on campus. And so as part of that, um, there's been a lot of discussion about theming for the building. Um, this will be soon proposed to the um, executive committee for the building, which is the provost, chancellor, and all the deans. And really, it's a, a theme around uh, you know, chemistry at the interface of biology and biotechnology. And, and so again, I think it's a, a benefit to, to many, many faculty. And this, along with uh, renovations to existing space, I think will help all faculty, whether or not they have life science uh, interests on campus. And so we're super excited about this, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Um, things move quickly with all of this, but we, we know what we at least know today. 
Um, and I'll just point out that for those of you that, that aren't in the life sciences or interface, you know, I encourage you to think about similar efforts like this. Um, it's been really fun to drive this forward, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to do this in other areas as well. And so um, happy to try to answer any questions about this or chat with anybody separately, either via email or otherwise. Yeah, so the building is, if everything remains on schedule, the building is slated to be occupied in 2026. And so sometime before 2026. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, late 23, um, early 24, probably, would be my guess. Um, the budget's about $160 million. Um, the, the state part of that is, has been approved. The, uh, the university, I, I think, is yet to raise their half, but I, I'm not privy to the status of that. You're probably more privy to that than I am. Any other questions? Everybody's so quiet today. All right. Well, look forward to working with many of you on this. And if you are interested in these general things I'm talking about and aren't currently involved, um, please get in touch. I'd love to chat about it and see how we can get you involved and, um, and move from there. And if anybody knows what an academy actually is relative to this, also let, let me know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay, and I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. My voice is usually loud enough, but not with the mask. <laughs> okay, so Kathy Dello, Director of the State Climate Office, and as I said, many people don't know that our college houses the State Climate Office. And Kathy is doing an amazing and remarkable job um, building, rebuilding the State Climate Office. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean McGann, for the invitation. It is wonderful to be here in person. I have done hundreds of events while wearing Nike running shorts and then some sort of nice thing on the top. And then I'd go to the grocery store wearing that and I'm, I'm glad that I've been forced to put on something, something a little bit more presentable. But yeah, I bet there's three camps of people in here. Those of you who do not know there's a state climate office, this is for you. Those of you who have maybe engaged with the state climate office before, this is your reintroduction. A lot has changed in the past two years. And then many of you may know exactly what we do, and you may be on my payroll, if that's the case. And I'm only gonna cover just a few things we could talk about a lot, but I thought I'd hit a few highlights. But in thinking about the climate crisis, it's here in a way that none of, none of us anticipated in 2021. We're feeling the extremes of climate, of climate change and our climate fueled disasters pretty much in every corner of the planet. And somebody said to me, wow, North Carolina's gotten off lucky this year. And I looked at them and said, we had an extremely deadly flood three weeks ago. And that's how fast these disasters are coming at us, that something like the Haywood flood, which is up by Asheville, which killed six people, is something that's quickly forgotten. And this headline kind of talks about what the State Climate Office does. We put a lot of events into context. And what we're finding with events like the Haywood flood that they're worse than anything we saw in our historical past. They're worse than what some models are telling us, and we are entirely unprepared for our changing climate. So in comes the State Climate Office. We're studying this huge, uh, this huge problem that really touches all 10.5 million North Carolinians. And we focus specifically on three mission areas. We do original research. This is often with state agencies or federal agencies who um, want us to address some aspect of the climate problem in the Southeast. So we work closely with North Carolina Department of Transportation to help them understand flooding on their roads. 
And we work with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to help them understand extreme heat. And then there's only 10 of us in the office. We are a fairly big office in terms of a state climate office, but we need to reach all 100 counties. And we do that through a really fruitful partnership with North Carolina Extension. And we, what we do is we go out and we work with some of their agents to help them understand their climate risks and climate impacts. And then the agents go out to their communities and talk to folks about what they should expect. And this is a, a really beneficial model. Kathy and Raleigh is not going to be trusted in every single community in North Carolina. And Extension has uh, really deep roots all around the state. And we work with education. We've worked closely with the Science House in the past year, helping K-12 students understand weather and climate. A lot of teachers are coming to us and saying, I've got to teach people about climate change. I've got to teach people about North Carolina's weather. Can you help me out? So we've built some curriculum with the Science House. And then monitoring. We get 1.5 million observations a day from our weather network, the North Carolina Econet, which helps us understand some of the intricacies of North Carolina's climate, but is also used by state agencies and the National Weather Service. So this project is very exciting. We just announced it this morning. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, named NC State as its 11th RESA, which is the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment which is meant to do really community-driven climate science. This is the program that I was trained under as a graduate student, so it feels really special to now be leading one of these. But we were very deliberate about including HBCUs on our team. We're working with UNC Chapel Hill. And what we're trying to do is address not just aspects of the climate crisis that you normally would, like heat waves or flood, but understand some of the inequities, some, understand some of the decisions that were made over decades and centuries that put frontline communities at risk. So our communities of color, our low-income communities, are the most impacted by climate change. They're the ones that the Haywood floods are very real for. And then this was a really exciting project that we did this summer, and our own Allison Hubbard just told me that she participated. We co-developed research with communities to help map urban heat islands in Raleigh and Durham. So we put out a call for volunteers and 500 people signed up. And what we needed them to do was drive around on their car with a sensor, and this has been vetted by a, an outfit out in Portland, Oregon. And NOAA gave us some money to engage community members in mapping their own neighborhoods to see what parts of the cities are the hottest. And it, this is great as an academic exercise, but we really need to operationalize this. So we worked closely uh, with the city of Raleigh in Durham County, we worked with the Museum of Life and Science to help put some of these things into, into action and create some policy. So there's really low hanging fruit with extreme heat. We could shade bus shelters. We could give people subsidies for cooling. A lot of poor people can't access air conditioning and can get sick on really hot days. And then this is an infrared camera picture that we took at the Bureau of Mines. And you can see on a really hot day that bench is probably not where you want to be spending your lunch, but maybe if we get that budget increase, we could put some, some shade over it. And then we have lots of data at the State Climate Office. Many of you have come to me and asked for it or come to members of our team. And we decided to replace our old access system, Kronos, with a system called Cardinal, which is the state bird of North Carolina. And this is really a one-stop shop for most of your climate data needs. Uh, historical climate now will put future climate in there over the next year. And it's a really neat tool. You can do some really rudimentary plotting using Station Scout, so you don't even need to download the data. So what I did here, and because folks ask me this all the time, mostly about their gardens, I looked at accumulated precipitation for the Raleigh Airport Station. And the black line is where we are this year. The green line is the wettest year on record. The brown line is the driest. And you can see the range of precipitation. So we were on track with the wettest year on record 2018, except that big jog up on the green line, that's Hurricane Florence. So we're, we're trending a little bit below there, but even though it's been dry these past few weeks, except for today, it's been a pretty wet year. And you can go onto our tool and look at these things very quickly. And then we're monitoring North Carolina's environment through our weather network, the North Carolina Econet. This supports agricultural decisions. It supports public health, 
Department of Health and Human Safety is downloading our data and putting it into their database. And also public safety, the National Weather Service and North Carolina Emergency Management rely on our stations to help fill some gaps. And the picture that I'm showing here is wet bulb globe temperature. And many of you know the real feel or the heat index. Wet bulb globe temperature is actually a better measure of heat stress. We are the only state that has our network outfitted with black globe thermometers to calculate this. And it's a really useful metric for knowing when you should be outside. So high school athletic associations are using it. The military uses it as well. When you're in the black, when you're in the red, don't go for your run. So we're putting these data out and serving them up to the public. And then I'll wrap this up. Like I said, I could go on forever, but I'm happy to chat with any of you more. We're also telling the story of a rapidly changing North Carolina. People are hungry for climate information. They wanna know what's happening to their neighbors and in their backyard. So we work closely with state agencies to develop risk profiles for the North Carolina Climate Risk Assessment and Climate Science Report. We did a webinar series on climate change in North Carolina, mostly for extension. And we put out a really fun, readable blog every month, sometimes two or three times a month if there's an event. Sign up for it. It's, it's a nice way to know what's going on in North Carolina and we tie a few things together. And then I got to duck out early of the National Climate Assessment meeting for the fifth National Climate Assessment, so we're par I'm participating in that as well. So a lot of talks, blogs, tweets, whatnot about North Carolina's climate. And I don't do this alone. I'm the person up here speaking. All the things I talked about, my team participates in. Many of them are online. I see Sheila in the back. She's our new associate director. We're happy to chat with any of you at any time. Call us, subscribe add us or visit our website and I think I have time for a question or two. Thank you. First of all, thank you for your wonderful presentation and the work that you're doing. Um, my question is, are you working closely with other state climate offices, and how would you say that ours compares in the work that we're doing to what other states have been working on? So I'm not just saying this. Ours is one of the best, and um, we're the second biggest. Uh, a number of states have come to me over the past few months and said, how are you guys doing it? We want to replicate it. So I'm going to brag about us for a little bit. Um, we do work closely with some state climate offices. The ones around us aren't as strong, and we found ourselves getting into situations where it was the North Carolina State Climate Office plus the entire Southeast. We were just kind of moving the box and doing a lot of things for the other states. That being said, a lot of states have mesonets like ours, the Weather Network, and we collaborate with them on ideas, or it's a lot of expensive things that break and they can help us troubleshoot some things, but. I'm happy to talk with you more about the office and what we do. Welcome. It is a quiet group. I don't know what an academy is either. <laughs> okay. So our, our next speaker is, uh, I'm sorry, Maria Gallardo-Williams, and uh, professor of chemistry and uh, award-winning teacher. Okay, let me find my presentation first. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about um, the work that we have been doing in my labs to create virtual reality organic chemistry labs. And before I even get started with um, the work that we've been doing, I would like to, for a second, take you back in time to pre-pandemic times and let you know that this project actually got started in 2013 way before any of us could conceive the idea that the university would be closed for this long. So 
I was teaching my organic chemistry lab one day, and I had a very sassy student who told me that I should learn how to make a YouTube tutorial. So I recruited that student and 25 more, and we made a lot of YouTube tutorials before everything happened. And we learned the ins and outs of how to make a digital object for learning, how to use um, students to generate content. So by the time that um, 2017, which is when this project got started, um, rolled around, we knew how to make student-generated video resources. So in 2017 was when I had the idea, now that we know how to make video resources with students, now that we have video resources for all the labs that we teach, is there a way that we could expand that? Is there a way that we could create a product that's even better? And that's how we got the idea to create this virtual reality lab experiences. Again, in 2017, nobody knew what was ahead of us. Nobody knew what was coming. So really, the idea to create this fully immersive experience was motivated by accessibility concerns. I ha I've always had a soft spot in my heart for pregnant students because they cannot be in the organic chemistry lab the whole time that they're pregnant, and sometimes that delays their graduation. Uh, deployed military students, um, you all may have had a, a military student in your class that disappears mid-semester because they got orders to go somewhere else. That is a big investment that we've made in those students in a chemistry lab, and it's lost when the student has to leave. And then students with disabilities, visually impaired students have a very difficult time coping with some of the lab experiments that we do in person. And even students that may not have a permanent disability, if you break your leg, it's going to be very difficult for you to stand in a chemistry lab the whole time that is needed to complete the experiments. So not all disabilities have to be permanent. Some of them are transient, but they still affect the time to graduation um, for our students. So with all of those things in mind, I was very inspired by some virtual reality documentaries that I um, watched in 2017, which were actually produced by some of our students. So that's where the idea came from. How about if we took our labs and we turned them into sort of a documentary, but with a find your own adventure theme, right? So that students would be able to do everything that they're supposed to do in an in-person lab, but in a virtual reality environment. So that um, was easier said than done. I was very lucky to get um, help from Delta, which has been invaluable for my experience here on campus. But in order to create something realistic, an immersive realistic experience, you have to do a lot of pre-production. Our pre-production started with filming a lot of labs, and figuring out how different students interact with the lab materials and how do they actually complete the labs, what kind of thinking goes behind that. Then the generation of endless flowcharts. If you think that this looks like a lot of stuff in this flowchart, that is only one-tenth of one part of one lab. So my office was literally wallpaper from top to bottom with lucid charts and flowcharts of all kinds, uh, which is not my favorite thing to do, I have discovered the hard way. And then that allowed us to move to the production stage. So producing a virtual reality documentary is a lot of fun for many reasons. Um, one of them is you have to be completely alone in the room where we're filming. So the person that is acting in the, in the lab has to be completely alone and the room has to be completely empty because we're filming in 360 degrees all the way to the ceiling and all the way to the floor. So any direction has to be done previously before we film, and you can't splice together little clips like you would do in a real video. It has to be done in one take for the whole segment. So there was a lot of rehearsing that went uh, behind that. We learned a ton about 360 video production. My TAs and my undergraduates did such a great job and were so patient with us. I don't think I can ever um, give them enough credit for the work that they did. It was a lot of fun, but it was also really hard. Then we got to the part that actually turned out to be the hardest part of this game, which was the post-production post stage, because the video and graphics components hadn't been developed yet for what we wanted to do. So even though there was virtual reality expertise out there that we could tap into, uh, mostly from Epic Games down in Cary, North Carolina, who were very helpful to us, there were still a lot of graphic elements that were just not available. So for example, at the time that we were in post-production of our first video, 
there was no way to generate a flat whiteboard inside a virtual reality simulation. And we had to work the kinks of all of that. So this is what the video looks like when it's captured. And as you can see, it's curved. And it's not going to work to put somebody inside of a curved environment. You wouldn't go watch an IMAX movie if the simulation didn't feel real. So we had to work out all those kinks and we had to come up with highly specialized ways to do it and also with a consistent graphic system so that the user experience was the same going from one lab to the next. So we spent a lot of time on that post-production issues and we finally, by the end of 2018, we had one video completed. Um, the, longest, the longest production time for anything that I've ever done, including my children. <laughs> so once we had that video completed, the question was, who is going to use this and how is it going to be deployed? And at that time, everybody told us that there was no market for this, that nobody would ever need a lab simulation. Why would they do that when they can come to campus and do the lab on campus? Well, let me tell you what. Uh, it, it turned out to be very, very important. But in order to convince the naysayers that said, this is not gonna be helpful to anybody, we had to evaluate it and make sure that it did work. So we did a pilot in the fall of 2018 in which we um, had a lab section that was taught with in-person students and, and very good TAs, and we had a lab section that was taught with virtual reality experiments. And the two methods were virtually indistinguishable in terms of student outcomes. So the lab reports from both, both sections were identical. When we gave the students quizzes two weeks later, the recall of the material could not be distinguished. So we knew that the students that took their lab in the virtual reality modality could produce the same kind of work as the students who took it in person. Going beyond that, um, it turns out that the students really liked it. Um, there's a comment here, down here from a student that says, I like that we still went through like a normal lab setting. I like the image and explanations associated with the answers and activities. We opened our mics with an open mic test at the end of each one of the labs and we let the students tell us anything they wanted to tell us about these labs. We didn't put any constraints on what they could say about it. And we never collected a negative comment. There was never a student that complained or said, I didn't like it, or I don't want to do it this way. In fact, a lot of the students that were in the in-person lab were beating down our door because they wanted to come and do it in the virtual reality way. So that was exciting. And then um, there was a pandemic. And then everybody wanted to do labs this way. So we took the opportunity to actually validate our labs during the pandemic using an instrument that's called MILI, Meaningful Learning in the Laboratory Instrument. That is an instrument that had been validated pre-pandemic and has been around since 2012. And when we apply that instrument, which is a survey, pre and post survey instrument, when we apply that instrument to our labs, we found out that virtual reality labs give better outcomes than in-person labs when we use that instrument, both in the effective dimension and in the cognitive effective dimension. So students not only like the labs, they do better in this kind of labs. And from our own testing, we know that they retain the material the same way as if you taught them in person. So COVID-19 was rough on all of us, but it wasn't as rough for me. I, I was very fortunate that I had a whole set of labs for the first semester of organic chemistry at that point. We were able to switch to online labs in one day in March of 2020. March 12, 2020, in case anybody wants to know. Um, the virtual reality labs enabled us to continue teaching th during the pandemic in a much more interactive way than, you know, videos or static content. And we shared that content online, and there were 53 partner institutions that took us up on it. And there are 53 other schools across the world that use our labs as their method to teach um, organic chemistry and have done through that through the pandemic. There's more than 53 schools that use our labs. Those are 53 official partners that we have agreements with who are actually helping us to collect data on the use of these labs in a big scale. We know that students like and appreciate the experience and that's one of the things that really has made a big difference for me. Um, being able to offer not only a pandemic resource but a resource that can be used long term if needed. 
just to give you an idea of the reach of our labs, um, the only way to access the lab is using Go Links. That is the only thing that we have released out there. So you have to go through, the, through a Go Link to open our labs. This is Go Link data for one of our labs for the period between August 17th and September 18th of this year. So from the first day of school until last week. And as you can see, the, the labs are being used all over the world. This dark blue is supposed to be about 40, 100,000 users, which is a lot of users. And those are only unique uses that are counted. And most countries in the world have at least some usage, except for some places in Africa that we haven't reached yet, but I'm still working on. <laughs> so the labs are popular all over the world, and that has been truly uh, very important for us. Now, we all wish that this pandemic would end. I know that there's nobody in this room that wouldn't be happy to hear that we don't have to do this anymore. But then the question would be, what are you gonna do with those labs once you know, the pandemic is over? And it turns out that I feel there's a lot of options for those labs, even post pandemic, right? We could use them as a distance education course for non-major students. We have proof that students learn this way and there's no detriment to their education. So why not offer them as a distance education offering for students that don't need to be in the lab and will not be using lab skills as part of their career. We can use individual labs to make up missed labs in case of absences. I just, since we started the semester, I've done that more than 100 times for students who have been either diagnosed with COVID or exposed to COVID in some way. So that has been a wonderful use of them. We can use them as pre-lab material if needed, and we're actually doing that for our majors, just to give them that extra dimension of doing the lab ahead of time and then coming in and practicing the skills that they have already seen. We could use them as post-lab review material, and my favorite one would be to offer this on demand and let students choose how they want to engage with the material. Everybody's different. You know, there may be students that really and truly want the in-person experience, but there may also be students who would choose to do this voluntarily because it is more convenient, less stressful, or it has a number of other advantages. So all of, all of those options are on the table and are open, and hopefully we will get to try all of those um, sometime in the future. And before I leave, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my team from Delta, who are really and truly a very dedicated group of people. Um, Kathy Donegan was our project lead, and Mike Wells was our creative director. All of these guys worked incredibly hard. Um, Rich Guernsey actually developed that flat whiteboard that causes so many nightmares. And um, Stephen Waddell used to be an undergraduate student that worked with me before he was hired by Delta to be on this project. So that's all um, very exciting, and I'm very thankful to them. And I'm also very thankful to my TAs, because without them, this project would not have been possible. So we had different instructors for each lab, and as you can see, they look different, they also sounded different. Each lab has a different flavor because each instructor gives that own personality to the lab, and as a result, students that complete the course in this manner are exposed to many different kinds of instructors and many different kinds of instruction, which was very important to me um, from a diversity and inclusion standpoint. And there really are real diversity um, within this project, you know, showing people that doesn't matter what your instructor looked like, there's many different ways that the information can come to you and that you can receive it. And that's all I got, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Hey Maria, this is Gavin, just in case you don't recognize me with my mask on. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, this is a loaded question, you probably know why I'm asking, but um, what would be the top two tips you would give to somebody who is planning to build their own VR experience? I think that the first one would be understand what your learning objectives are. You can't build any kind of educational experience without learning objectives, but in this case, it's more important than ever. Because in an in-person experience, you can improvise some things along the way. And if you forgot something, you can put it in, or you can remove it if you have too much material. This has to be lean and mean. It has to be straight to the point, and you have to know exactly what you want to say and how you want to say it. So that would be my first, my first thing. 
And then the second one would be find a team to work with you. You know, I don't know how to do half of the stuff that we did in this labs. I don't know, we, we had a person in the team, um, Steven, who was called a node wrangler. So that, that's not, some, not something that you hear every day. I don't know how to wrangle nodes. It turns out that that's something that you have to do when you have a simulation that has more than one possible ending because students will make choices and the simulation will branch and somebody has to wrangle all of that. So find a team that knows what they're doing. This is not a, this is not a job for lone wolves. You're gonna need a team because each member of the team is gonna do something um, that is gonna be different and all of those things are gonna be important. So those would be my top two. Um. Yeah, this is really exciting stuff. Uh, what, uh, what kind of equipment do people need to be able to access this, and is there a way to do it like, without the VR aspect to get some of that if they don't have that equipment? Yes, there is. Um, so to access the simulations, all you need to do is you download a free app that is called Wanda VR, and that gives you access. And then if you have a VR helmet, like an Oculus or um, any of the commercial, including Google Cardboard, you can just put your phone inside the VR helmet and you can watch it that way. If you don't have a VR helmet or you don't want to use virtual reality, you can use either your phone as a magic window and, and select commands by hand. It's not nearly as exciting, but people do that. Or you can watch the simulations in the computer. So we provide links. Um, in our website, we provide QR codes that you can scan with your phone if you wanna go that route, and we also provide links and if you go that route, you can just watch them in the computer and move around using your cursor. We never wanted anybody to feel like they had to do it in one way. Because um, to me, that's, that kind of defeats the purpose of making it accessible. Um, there's many reasons why people may not want to do virtual reality, and I learned a lot of those reasons this past year. And access is a big one. You know, if you don't have the money to buy a virtual reality helmet or you can't come to campus to borrow one, you can do it on your phone and you can, get the, you can get the lab done. And a lot of students told us that they did it that way because that's what they had accessible. So yeah, uh, flexibility in, in the way that we d delivered them was very important to us. As a chemistry alum over 30 years ago, I'm very proud that you guys are leading this, so thank you, this is great. Thank you. Uh, can you can you simulate lab mistakes with this? And, and the example I'll use is when I took my labs in Withers, I made a lot of titration mistakes. I mean, can you simulate that? And so someone can say, if, if you're not this precise, this is what's going to happen? You can make mistakes, yes. There are, there are many decision points um, in the videos. Usually, at, at the very least, there are six or seven decision points where you will have to decide how much material you're going to use, how long you're going to heat it, how you're gonna proceed, there's different decisions in each lab. If you make a decision that is not productive, we don't call them mistakes, we call them non-productive decisions, right? Because it's less, it's less offensive. Um, if you make a mistake, the TA will redirect you and will ask you to go back and consider if maybe there was a better option there. So in some labs, um, so we actually tested this to see if people you know, were making a lot of mistakes and in most labs, people may make one or two unproductive decisions and then they, they find religion and they do everything well after that. In some labs, um, the number of non-productive decisions is very high throughout for some students, right? So we, um, we're trying to work with that data to figure out, we know that the students completed the labs. How much does that redirection influence the student's decision to continue with the labs, to stick with it. We have very little attrition, so most students do complete the lab in this format, so it's not like people leave, but is that support from the, from the TA, from the virtual TA, important in their permanence? And what we're finding is that there is. And students tell us, you know, it doesn't matter how many mistakes I made, I made it to the end because the TA redirected me or explained it to me, which is a very strange way to say that a, a recording of a TA explain to you things that you should do, but, but they really do feel very personal when you're watching. So yeah, you can make mistakes. You can blow up the lab though. I, I drew the line at that.
Okay. Our next speaker is Katie Mack. Um, she is a professor in physics, and she, her work is in trying to understand the secrets of the universe and then try to help the rest of us in the world understand that. So thank you, Katie, for being here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, after those two awesome presentations, I think I'm, I'm here to represent the much less useful um, kind of, uh, you know, blue sky, flights of fancy kind of science uh, that, that goes on at, at, uh, here as well. Um, so I'm a cosmologist, which means that I'm interested in the universe as a whole, its evolution, its history, what it's made of, and so on. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the beginning and the end and kind of the, the connections between those two things. Um, and one of the amazing things that we can do in cosmology is we can look out into the universe, into the distance, and see very, very distant objects and use that to directly see the earliest times in the cosmos. We can look back in time and actually see the past in the universe, and we can study these very, very distant galaxies that are you know, billions and billions of light years away and learn about what happened in the early days of the universe. Um, and so we have amazing data from you know, telescopes. This is from the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, an image of some of the earliest, most distant galaxies in the universe. But one of the things that we find when we look at those observations is that most of the universe is actually completely invisible. Um, we can't see it at all. We can't interact with it at all. Most of the universe is, is really a mystery. And we can, what we can do is we can use observations to quantify that mystery. And we can say that about you know, 26, 27% of the universe is what's called dark matter, which is a kind of invisible stuff that holds galaxies together, that makes up the, the bulk of the, the matter, the stuff in the universe that has gravity. Um, and then most of the rest of the universe is something called dark energy, which is even more mysterious. It's something that makes the universe expand faster. Um, we do not understand why it's here, where it came from. Um, we have uh, some information about what it's doing, what it's done in the past, and we can use it to make inferences about the future. But we really don't understand it, and we, we can't see it. It's invisible, just like dark matter is. And then, you know, there's this sort of 5% slice that's, you know, everything we've ever detected or measured or described in the cosmos. Um, and so that's what we have to work with. Um, it's, it's not a lot, but we can use that to make inferences about the, um, about the rest of the universe. And we can do some really amazing things with that. So, um, for example, we can take uh, simulations of distributions of just dark matter in the universe and apply time and gravity and, and see the formation of a, this amazing cosmic web. So in this simulation, each little white dot is sort of a clump of dark matter and, the, and you can see this, the, basically um, each little white dot represents where a galaxy will live someday in the universe. And so you can do these simulations of vast stretches of cosmic time and see the formations of uh, galaxies. These are not my simulations, by the way, these are, but these are um, how we learn about the formation of galaxies and so on in the context of this invisible stuff, this dark matter. And we can use uh, more sophisticated computations and look at how galaxies are forming in these webs of dark matter. And on this, in this simulation, which is also not mine, but, uh, but uh, simulations I use uh, information from, uh, the left-hand side is, is dark matter, and the right-hand side is the temperature of the gas, and you can see how sort of galaxies are forming and, and blowing these bubbles of uh, where supernovae happen and stars are exploding, and we can do a lot of really amazing stuff computationally to understand what's going on in the universe. And my uh, work is to look at these uh, situations where we have this dark matter as the kind of uh, scaffolding upon which all of the regular matter is forming and wonder, you know, what happens if inside those dark matter clumps there's uh, more new physics going on. So we think that dark matter probably has some kind of weird particle interactions where maybe two dark matter particles can come together and annihilate with each other and create energy and heat 
and how does that affect how the first stars and galaxies are forming? And so I don't have pretty pictures to represent my work because it's, it's uh, you know, sort of computational, lots of equations, <laughs> numerical stuff. Um, but the idea is to use those kinds of computations and figure out what we will see with new telescopes, uh, new radio frequency observations, to learn about these early galaxies and to try and figure out what that dark matter really is. Not just where it is, not just how it comes together, but what it is fundamentally on a sort of particle level. Um, so I'm, I've just, uh, just been awarded an SF grant to work on uh, that question and, and really try and get to the bottom of what's going on with dark matter in the earliest galaxies in the universe. And meanwhile, I'm also interested in sort of the other end of time, uh, what is gonna happen in the distant future of the universe and how is the universe gonna develop when the galaxies are uh, dying, when, when the universe becomes much less um, you know, uh, structured, when the expansion of the universe carries on and, and turns, the, you know, turns the universe dark in, in its last days. Um, this is a simulation, also not my simulation. I don't have pretty pictures in my, in my work, so I show other people's pretty pictures. But anyway, um, this is a simulation of what's gonna happen when the Andromeda galaxy collides with our galaxy in, in several billion years and, and how our night sky will change. But after that happens, uh, the expansion of the universe is gonna make the universe much darker, much colder, and much emptier. And someday, the universe will end. And this is a, a, um, a topic that's been a point of fascination for me for the last several years, thinking about different ways the universe might end. And so I wrote a book about that uh, called The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking. And um, in this book, I go through several different ways that the universe might end and what that would look like and how we're learning about it. Um, and I, I bring this up because uh, this is something that's, uh, this kind of sharing the sort of big conceptual scary stuff in an accessible way is a big part of what I am passionate about and what I do here with the support of NC State. So I'm in the Leadership for Public, for Public Science cluster, which is a uh, cluster that brings together people doing various kinds of science connected with the public. And uh, being part of that has allowed me to take the time to write a book for the general public um, in my first few years as a junior faculty, which is something that a lot of people in the sciences don't have the option to do, and so it's been an amazing opportunity to be here to do that. Um, and it's just, a, a, when, when you do the kind of work that um, doesn't you know, save lives <laughs> or, um, or sort of you know, revolutionize teaching, it's nice to be able to at least share uh, my passion with, with the world and to, to bring that, um, that kind of awe and wonder about the universe uh, to, to other people and hopefully inspire people in some way. Um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm working on kind of these questions about both ends of the universe and really trying to figure out kind of what we really know about the cosmos and where we're going with it. And I just wanted to share um, a couple of um, headlines from, uh, from a few years back talking about, uh, from a, a, an astronomy and geophysics magazine, uh, talking about kind of where we are with cosmology right now, with the study of the cosmos. So, these are, are two headlines from the same uh, issue. One is, is everything we know about the universe wrong? And you can see that pie chart there um, about you know, most of the universe is invisible, we don't understand it. And then uh, the, other, the other side, some of the things we know about the universe are, are probably right. Um, and so I think that personally, I kind of take both sides of that argument. I think that there's a lot that we don't know about the universe. There's a lot that is probably gonna turn out to be wrong but we are learning some things and there is hope and there is a direction that we can go to, to find out something about the universe. And so I'm kind of dabbling in a lot of different those areas there to uh, try, and, try and discover something about what the universe is made of, where it came from, and ultimately where we're going. So, thanks. Any questions? Thanks, Katie. Um, this is a question from our online audience, uh, and the question is, might the universe reboot? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so there's, 
there are some really interesting ideas about uh, sort of cyclic universes, um, where the universe would end one way or another, some cases with some kind of contraction, some cases with an expansion that, that leads to a new phase, and then a new universe would, would spring up uh, from the, the aftermath of that. Um, it wouldn't necessarily go the same way that it did the first time, and you know, it's not necessarily that much constellation if you're the universe that died and then a new one comes along. But, um, but there are some really interesting possibilities for, for endless cycles of the universe. And, um, uh, and my, my PhD advisor, Rebecca Princeton, was one of the people who was really excited about those uh, topics. So it's sort of dear to my heart as well. Hi there, Katie. Hi. I just wanted to say um, thank you for sharing. And even though um, a lot of us feel that we're not saving lives like first responders, <laughs> you are changing lives by being there for the students, um, all the faculty, staff, and um, um, who are here for the students on a daily basis. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question uh, from the online audience. Um, sure. I was wondering what your thoughts on the multiverse are. Yeah, yeah, the multiverse. Um, it depends on what you mean by multiverse. There are a few different, there's a multiple, no, there are multiple ways of defining a multiverse, but um, there's uh, one idea is just that the universe is so big that there are regions of it that are so far away from us that they may as well be other universes in a, in a sort of technical, physical way. They really are separate uh, universes from ours. Um, and that's, kind of an assumption that we go with, that probably probably there are um, other, spa or other regions of space that are far enough away that are essentially other universes, and those can have different properties, different physics than our universe, so it's, there's a lot of really interesting uh, work going on looking at that. Um, but there's also uh, a lot of interesting discussion around quantum mechanics, around the idea of the many worlds uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is, which is where sort of every time a quantum mechanical event happens, every time like a subatomic particle moves left or right, a new universe branches off, and then you have these parallel universes where like slightly different things happen. And that comes up all the time in science fiction. So if you're, if you're a science fiction aficionado or into sort of Marvel universe kind of stuff, like that happens um, in, those, in those contexts. Um, and that's much more sort of controversial and uh, some, some physicists take it seriously, some physicists don't. Um, so it kind of goes back and forth there. Um, but I think that there's definitely a lot of interest, especially in sort of string theory and, and other uh, sort of theoretical cosmology contexts of the idea that, that there could be parts of the universe that are just physically very different from our own because they are separated from us. They might have had slightly different histories and that, that can create a kind of multiverse um, that uh, could have implications for the origin of our universe and, and its future and so on. Okay, I okay. think we'll, thank you. I think, is this on? Okay. Uh, I, I did want to congratulate Katie on her book because um, it was reviewed in the New York Times Book Review, which is high status, about as high status as you can get. And uh, she's, it's also been ranked in the top 100 books of the year. Um, on some lists, and so congratulations on that. <laughs> Grabbing an audience that is not generally physicists, <laughs> then, which is what the purpose of your public science role is. So thank you and congratulations. And I wanna thank the other speakers, all the speakers. Uh, I, I really like um, this venue where we get to hear uh, things that are happening in the college, and uh, it, it was great last time, this time, and thank you all for everything that you do. And um, now I know we're done now. I wish we were having a reception, but there are cookies. <laughs> no wine, but there's some cookies on your, on your way out. Thank you all for, for coming, and uh, thank you all for everything that you do for the college. And just as a side note, if the gluten-free and the vegan cookies are on the table over there, clearly marked. <laughs>